And we go on to Dr. Vijay Kumar now, who's going to tell us why not trifocal post laser vision connection. On to you, Vijay. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about why not trifocal post laser vision correction. So since the 90s, the laser vision correction is the most performed procedure all over the world for spectacle independence. Since the 90s, there are over 40 million procedures done all over the world and it's still now, so far it's still counting. And the early beneficiaries are now aging. They've either reached presbyopia or either they developed visually significant cataract. So these are the two subsets of patients who, under, who are the early beneficiaries of laser vision correction in the 90s who come to our clinic. The first subset who have not developed cataract who come to us with presbyopia will come to, say, come to us saying, I don't want to wear reading glasses at all. For such patients, we have options like monovision correction by uh, lifting the LASIK flap and doing an XM laser. The second subset who have developed visually significant cataract, they come to us again saying that they don't want to wear glasses post-operatively. So first, for such subset, subset of patients, we would like to do a multifocal eye wall implantation. Currently, we have this trifocal eye wall design designed with Toric. So the advantage of placing in, in trifocal eye wall is it, it provides intermediate visual acuity without sacrificing distance and near vision. And the contrast sensitivity is also shown to be good if the cases are selected properly. So this is a major study done in 2021, which was published in JCRS by Rosario et al., which has shown that the current diffractive trifocal eye wells are compatible with the photo ablated cornea with adequate predictability, efficacy, and safety outcomes. So the biggest conundrum in doing a trifocal eye well in a post-LASIK eye, eye is to identify the exact power to implant in the eye to achieve emetropia. So we would generally uh, take up a aspheric eye well design so that spherical aberration is negated. The so traditional eye well power calculation formulas no longer apply in a post LVC eye. In myopic correction, the anterior corneal surface gets flatter, resulting in lower K readings. And the ratio between the anterior and posterior corneal curvature also gets uh, altered. The aspericity becomes oblate from prolate. So the IOL power generally gets underestimated use, if we use SRKT or hover Q formula because the effective lens question, as Dr. Vardaman has already pointed out, is getting underestimated because of the flattened cornea. But still, we can achieve emetropia with careful case selection and assessment. So what are the important things to assess preoperatively is the most important being ocular surface. As Dr. Vardaman has already mentioned, LASIK causes some element of dryness and with aging, I think it gets accentuated. So it's important to assess the tear film stability using a lippy view, a T-bet or a Schirmers. And in case if it's unstable, we have to treat it first and make it stable and then proceed with corneal topography. And once the corneal topography, we get to know the steep axis where to place the incision and also it will help us to estimate the central corneal power. Newer generation formulas need central corneal power to exactly uh, identify the intraocular lens power. And also with the topography, we can identify whether it's the post LASIK uh, topography shows regular cornea in the, especially in the central 4mm zone and the topographic results are reproducible and repeatable. And also the centration of flap along with higher order aberrations, especially coma and spherical aberration. And also we will also get to know the angle kappa. Using ray tracing with the eye trace, the corneal aberrations can be distinguished between the uh, which the aberrations are from the corneal surface or by the cataract. Wavefront abrometry is also important before surgery to assess the severity of corneal aberrations. The ratio is kept between 0.3 to 0.5 to give uh, accurate measurements. And this is one of the post LASIK eyes with good centration and with minimal uh, higher order induced higher order aberrations like trifoil and karma. Accurate axial length measurement is very, very important in assessing the IOL power. 
So the optical biometry using the IOL master 700 laser star would help and it should be rechecked using an immersion A scan. A proper dilated fundus examination is essential to rule out any myopic macular and peripheral regenerations before proceeding for the surgery. And an anti-segment OCT to assess the exact corneal thickness, lacy flap thickness and stromal bed. In case if we end up in a surprise post-op, we might need to do a bioptics. This would help us for post-operative adjustment. So this is the most important step, IOL power calculation, because the main error is using a normal a usual formula can underestimate the IOL power because it assumes that the anterior and posterior corneal curvature is the same. But in the myopic LASIK, the anterior corneal surface is flatter, resulting in a lower diopteric power IOL implantation, which would cause hyperopic shift in such patients who already had a good near vision. The visual acuity worsens for all distances. So these are the important formulas which are which will help us to assess the uh, intraocular lens power, Hagis L, which will be useful in myopic and hyperopic patients. The Barrett True K, which is equal to or better than the online calculator in myopic LASIK and post PRK. The AS ASCRS online calculator using Potwin Hill formula and Barrett True K, which gets the input from Shreem Flag as well as OCT. And the method to assess the corneal power is Wong Cock Melanie method. Angle kappa is again an important thing before proceeding for a dry focal level. It's the so axis between. One minute left. Yes. Shall I proceed? Yes, yes. Yes. So angle kappa is the angle between the visual axis and the pupillary axis between the white and the blue dot. So this is very important as because especially in a post hyperopic, my, uh, I mean, LASIK patient, they tend to have a larger angle kappa. When we place a trifocal or a multifocal IOL, there is a chance of post operative lens disintegration, which would increase patient dissatisfaction. So, for such patients with slightly larger angle kappa, it would be better if we use a larger central optic zone IOL. So, these are my evidences where, in a post LASIK eye, a trifocal IOL implantation has been done. Especially in this study by uh, Rosario et al., which was published in JCRS in 2021, 868 eyes have been assessed, wherein 319 were myopic and 549 for hyperopic. The conclusion shows that there is good visual outcomes in high myopia and good precision in hyperopia. The next uh, supportive study is Brenner et al. in Presbyterian Lens Exchange with the trifocal IOL post carnal LVC. There is utilization of optimized IOL constants and nomogram can improve refractive questions, which will give a good refractive counts, uh, outcome. So, the most important step again is counseling. We have to uh, tell the patient that patient has to be patient for at least six to eight weeks post op because the initial uh, four to eight weeks, there is a chance of uh, carnal edema or uh, flap edema, which can uh, cause glass and halo. So we have to wait for six to eight weeks to uh, reduce the inflammation completely, uh, uh, assess, reassess the eye at six to eight weeks, which will give excellent visual acuity if uh, the preoperative assessment is done properly. And that should be uh, uh, given, the patient should be given extra chair time to focus uh, by uh, lowering their expectations and uh, this should always tell that there, is, there might be a need for secondary procedure in case we end up with a refractive surprise like an IOL exchange or a TCAT. And there are important so steps now, during you surgery. You conclude, uh, Vijay. Yes. Yes, the, the three important steps in intraoperative uh, precautions is to placement of incision, it should avoid a lysic flap and it should be outside the flap to minimize damage by the facultive cannulas or accidental insulation. And in case of post-operative fine-tuning, there shouldn't be no problem in lifting the flap. Thank you so much. Yes, valid thoughts, uh, Vijay. So